Good evening, and welcome to Grace Lutheran. It is very nice to have you with us tonight. Uh, as we move into the summer months, I always notice people shift to avoid the glare. Um, but there are a lot of people traveling. I know that for certain this week as well, too. Uh, and we will keep them in our prayers. In fact, we have a group of scholars and their families being led by Mrs. Sippet and Mr. Mackey that are going to Germany. Uh, and if I'm counting things up right, uh, we have over 20 people in Europe this week. So we will definitely keep traveling people in our prayers. Uh, a welcome tonight, particularly to those who are visiting us online, uh, whether you're doing that live right now uh, or you're going to watch the recording later. We're happy to have you with us. I did want to let you know, too, that the school office is closed this week. Church office is open during its normal time, which is in the summer, 8 to 4, Monday to Thursday. It is closed on Friday. So do keep that in mind. But it's open 8 to 4, Monday to Thursday. I will not be here Monday, uh, but Pastor Massey and, um, and Deaconess May will be here. So 8 to 4, Monday through Wednesday. We do have owls resuming this week. And I really think that's everything I needed to say. So at this time, I'll invite everybody to please stand as we call upon our God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is in him. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O oh Lord, kept a record of sin, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sin. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Glory be to the Father, and for God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is our true Sabbath rest. Help us to keep each day holy by receiving his word of comfort that we may find our rest in him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after Pentecost is from Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do not do any work you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of egypt and the lord your god brought out brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves, as your servants for Jesus sake for God who said let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the second chapter. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, the disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. I'd like you to do something for me. Please take out that maroon-colored LSB hymnal uh, that's in front of you or hopefully close by you and, and turn to page 321. Page 321 in the hymnal. You know, this used to be very interesting because I remember back to the time I was a pastor back at a time when a lot of churches had that old TLH hymnal. That was either reddish or a uh, blue color, depending upon which one you had purchased. And then you had to t say, turn to the forefront of the hymnal uh, because the numbers started over again with the hymns. So you had two ones, two twos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was kind of confusing and difficult. I have to say that an editorial decision was made very early on with this one to start page one with Psalm 1. Makes sense, right? And then not to renumber, but rather there's 330 pages in the beginning part. It includes the liturgies. Uh, it includes lectionaries. In fact, that's where the deaconesses and I get the scripture readings that we use when we're writing our devotions. Um, it includes services to use at home. It includes the small catechism. That's where I just had you turn. 330 pages and then page 331, if you will, is the first hymn. And I think the hymns go through 900 or so. This hymnal really is a great resource. Uh, and everybody should have one at home. You know, I have people come to me all the time. They say, Pastor, I don't know how to pray. Well, there are all these hymns in here. There's an index at the end. You can look up a topic or something that's troubling you, and, and it'll tell you what hymns work. And these hymns are prayers. This is really a great resource, along with your Bible, uh, it would give you everything you needed at home to practice your faith during the week. All right, hopefully we're on page 321. You see there the small catechism. You see the Ten Commandments as well, too. And we're going to do this old school uh, style. We're going to look at the Third Commandment. I'm going to ask you what the Third Commandment is, and I'm going to ask that you would say it or read it out loud. What is the third commandment? Very good. Let me tell you something else. This is going to be very much a catechetical or teaching sermon. So I am going to ask you some questions along the way. Most of them will be rhetorical. Some of them won't. But that's how catechesis or teaching in the church works. So I'm going to do a little teaching with this because, of course, the commandments are the word of God. You heard that in the Old Testament reading for today, didn't you? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy is God's word. And here's what I wanted to say. There are ten commandments. The Bible says that. What it doesn't do is list them by number. So there is some disagreement among Christians about what our commandments and what ex what verses might be explanations of the commandments and so there'll be subtle little differences not in what is commanded not in what god's word says but in the way we number them so as lutherans we call the remember the sabbath day the third commandment there are other christians who call it the fourth commandment so don't get confused by that all right, let's get on to the next part. What does this mean? Okay, so that's distinctively Lutheran. It is. Luther, when he wrote the small catechism, he recognized and realized uh, that people did not know the basics of the faith at all. That even some of the pastors of the church that were formerly Roman Catholic priests didn't know the Lord's Prayer. 
So he wrote this catechism so that Christians could learn their faith. And what he did with the commandments was really brilliant. He revealed or unpacked what Jesus did actually in the Sermon on the Mount, where he expanded the commandment to have a positive meaning. There's not just a prohibition or a command thou shalt, but there's also a positive teaching element to the Ten Commandments. Here it's, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. And hopefully you do, because this is going to be the longest sermon I've ever preached in my life. Seriously. And there is a reason for that. The reason is this. The Pentecost season is a time of teaching. And the first two Sundays after Pentecost are times when we should be establishing clearly again and reviewing clearly again the basics of the faith. And lo and behold, we get a gospel reading that discusses the third commandment. So since this is a catechetical or teaching type of sermon, question and answer form, I've got a rhetorical question for you now. Here's that next one. You don't have to say anything out loud. I just want you to think about this for a moment. In our culture, when is a person considered an adult? 18, 21, after high school, my grandson graduates this Monday. It's hard for me to think of him as an adult, but I guarantee he thinks of himself that way. How about college? When? As a child growing up in the 1960s, I recall that there was a popular saying among adults and teens then that went like this, never trust anyone over the age of 30. There's a song by the Who, My Generation, that captured that saying. And as an aside, it's actually a frightening song when you listen to it, with an implied expletive directed towards parents and grandparents of that day. It's frightening because it builds on the natural divisiveness that exists already between differing generations. That divisiveness is there due to sin, actual and original. I told you this would be a catechetical sermon and that the first few weeks of Pentecost lend themselves towards teaching the basics of the faith. And so, as I reflected upon this weekend's gospel and the ongoing events in our country and world that seemingly accomplish nothing but divide, again this week, we managed to figure something out that will divide us further. I realize this. My generation, the baby boomer one, they have talked about peace and love. But like all generations before and since, we've really done nothing to promote them by our actions. We've reaped what we've sowed, and quite honestly, it is depressingly ugly out there. I don't even care to think about it. That's why I'm here. Because like Peter said to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Like Peter, that's what I believe, teach, and confess. I hope that it is what you believe and confess, too. 
Get, getting back on track, I, I asked about our culture's definition of adulthood as a lead-in to teach that amongst the first century Hebrew people, 13 was the age. However, According to Numbers 4.47, Levites and priests did not become adult enough until the age of 30. And so it was that St. Luke wrote that Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about the age of 30. Therefore, when he turned 30, Jesus showed up at the Jordan to be baptized by John, and then it was on for him. Battles and struggles against a variety of powers and authorities, worldly and otherworldly. It's true. Here's what St. Mark writes about it. After Jesus' baptism, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by the devil. Not long after that, Jesus began to call his disciples and soon they came into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority, not like their scribe. And immediately there was there in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Recapping what we heard way back in the Epiphany season, the last time we had green, by the time that incident was over, the demon was cast out. And people were saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his fame spread. Now, of course, it comes as no surprise that Jesus encountered resistance from Satan and his minions. And, and that his first battles were with them. Remember how the Lord himself put it in Genesis chapter 3, speaking directly to the serpent, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall crush his heel. In today's gospel, however, that battle is joined by the very people who should have been trumpeting the Messiah's arrival. Uh, actually, they were, uh, or more accurately, they thought that they were. I I've noted on numerous occasions in Bible studies, and, and I think perhaps even from this pulpit a time or two, that the first century was a time of heightened messianic awareness. And numerous false messiahs or Christs appeared on the scene. Our biblical experts identify over a hundred of them. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and teachers of the law back then could read the signs from the Old Testament Bible. They were aware that the time was ripe for God to send his anointed one, that's what Messiah or Christ means into the world. From their perspective, he was coming to redeem Israel and restore it to its former glory. And they were partially right. Some more right than wrong. You see, the time was indeed ripe for the Messiah to come. St. Paul noticed, uh, uh, noted this in his letter to Titus. But it wasn't just Paul or, or the Jewish leaders back then. Others, Gentile others, noted it too. It's right here in the Bible. You've read it before. Remember the Magi from the East? How they had studied the scriptures and read in the book of Numbers, I see him but not now. I behold him but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel. 
When a star appeared in the sky, it says here, they followed it because they read, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Well, today's skirmish with the Pharisees was the first in what was to be an ongoing battle line, primarily over the proper understanding of the Bible and the role of human tradition in a believer's life. We engaged in some human tradition earlier when you all stood for the singing of that hymn. It was good tradition, but it's not God's law. At any rate, when the Magi arrived in Jerusalem, it marked the first fight for Jesus against worldly authority. That's right. Rather than performing his kingly stewardship of preparing God's people for the Messiah's coming, Herod sought to rub them out because he felt threatened. God came to Jesus' stepfather, Joseph, in a dream. And the Holy Family fled to Egypt, as the angel had said, so that the words of the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I have called my son. It was not time for him to die just yet. But even Jesus' presence outside of Jerusalem as an infant was enough of a threat for Herod to act. He was content with what he had and wanted to cling to his old way of life. That was his God. How about you? Do you feel threatened today as you come before the same Christ whose very presence in the world was starting already to change everything, just as we heard in this evening's gospel? Prior to the Sabbath events reported about in that reading, Jesus had told a parable about wine and wineskins with prophetic overtones that were fulfilled in our verses. It went like this. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Truth be told, anyone coming in here should feel a bit threatened, a, a little uneasy, just like any of us does when we head to the hospital or doctor's office for a procedure of some sort. What's the saying? We're going under the knife. Something that is harmful will be removed, but there is that nagging concern that we might get hurt in the process. That's what happens here. God's law will invariably seek to remove the sin that lies inside of each of us. It threatens our well-being. Myself included. Here's some more catechesis. Sometimes people ask me why I commune myself. It's what they taught me at seminary. And it's because the celebrant is the one who distributes the Holy Communion to God's people. By communing myself and then also by distributing the bread, I'm modeling that for you. There, I've taught you. It's also very much in line with the historic practice of the church. It's what they did at the time of the Reformation. Although, like all things not commanded, or forbidden by God, there's a certain freedom to it. We can do it. We could not do it. It's also interesting to me that no one has ever asked me why I preach to myself. I do. For you see the law that you hear, that which cuts you to your heart like a knife, has already cut me first. And in fact, I've heard it several times more than you have. First, when I wrote it. Next, 
when I practiced to deliver it. And then once on Saturday and twice on Sunday. Oh no, that's when I take a shower. In today's gospel, the Pharisees approached Jesus thinking they had him dead to rights. You see, harvesting, get this, was one of the 47 forbidden activities according to their Sabbath tradition. So they thought they had him. And that was good, because in their eyes, they were not comfortable with his growing popularity. Like Herod, they felt threatened by Jesus, and no doubt all the more so with what happened next. Jesus quickly pointed out that there was no such thing as 47 forbidden Sabbath day activities. In fact, King David himself had harvested on the, day, on the Sabbath in a time of need, way back when. So Jesus summarized the commandment neatly. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. After all, ultimately, the Sabbath's purpose is to hold God's word sacred and gladly to hear and learn it. On that account, I'm sure you're happy that this is an overly long sermon, aren't you? I hope so, because the best part is yet to come. Last question. Do you know what the best part is? Here's a hint. Remember, I said at the start that we're going back to basics. Does that help? Do you know now? It's the gospel. While the law always accuses us of our sin, the gospel freely offers God's gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. When he was an infant, the time was not yet right for God the Son Jesus to die because he, was not, he had not as yet lived out the messianic vision that God the Holy Spirit had revealed to the prophets. There was still a lot left for him to say and to do so that these words and deeds might become the Spirit's vehicle for bringing saving grace to bear in the hearts, minds, and souls. Jesus' words and deeds are the gospel by which you are being saved, dear friend in Christ Jesus. Already here in Mark chapter 2, they were the words and deeds by which the disciples were being saved. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. They would soon say to Jesus, and so finally for us today, that same Lord Jesus is present still in the Word. For he himself is the Word made flesh. And also in, with, and under the bread and the wine of the Holy Communion. Here he meets us with the words of eternal life. And they are given directly to you for your travels through life in this world. You might be his light for others to see and then for your ultimate arrival in the life of the world to come. By that word and sacrament, you have a part in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, all of which have earned you the forgiveness of your sins and the life everlasting. Praise be the holy name of Jesus forever. Amen. Please stand and join with me in confessing our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God.
be seated for the prayer of the church. In our prayers this evening, we remember all of those listed on our prayer page, uh, but we do highlight and add the following prayer request. A prayer of thanksgiving for our vicar-elect, Jonathan and wife Haley, at the birth of a daughter, Sophia Diane, last weekend. Also, for those who are hospitalized or uh, having upcoming surgery, including Lucy Clark, who is Beth Christopher's granddaughter, Patty Pauley, Steve Wangle, for Martha Rocky, President Rocky's wife, who is hospitalized and uh, recovering from a significant illness, and also Paul Fanacci, uh, who is extremely ill with cancer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. God of all light and power, you shine upon your create uh, creatures and eradicate all darkness that lies within them. Destroy the darkness of our, our sin has caused in our lives. Help us to shine the light of your grace and truth, Lord, in your mercy. Lord of glory, you have gathered your church and sanctified us in your truth. Guide and direct Matthew, our synod president, James, our district president, and Pat, our circuit visitor. Preserve all vacant congregations. Send laborers into your harvest and sustain those whom you have sent. Be with those of us who serve at Grace, particularly our day school and summer camp staff, that this might be a time of respite for them. Also, watch over Jennifer, Eric, and those who are traveling with them on the Grace trip to Germany this upcoming week. Lord, in your mercy. Bless the fields and orchards with good weather, that all people may be well supplied and filled with an awareness of your mercy. Grant that we may show forth grateful and generous hearts within your church and in the world around us. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have established all authorities on the earth. Bless all public servants, especially Joseph, our president, and Ron, our governor that they would fulfill their offices with wisdom and compassion. Be with the men and women who serve in our armed forces, especially those listed on our prayer page, to those nations in the world that are our allies and are in war-torn areas. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, be the strength and song of those who are afflicted in body or mind especially those listed on our prayer page, including Martha, Patty, Paul, Steve, Lucy, those whom we name silently in our hearts before you, those who mourn, the Gus family, the White family. We give thanks to you with those who give thanks, particularly the Papa family at the birth of a baby girl. Lord, in your mercy, give repentance and faith to all who receive our Lord's body and blood today, that in the unity of a true confession, they may receive it for the forgiveness of their sins. Lord, in your mercy, in your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And at this time, we wish the Lord's blessing upon those who have been viewing us online. Uh, we hope and pray that you'll come back and see us next week, or perhaps even be well enough to be here live. For the rest of us, the offering slide is there as a reminder that our offering plates are still up on, uh, and also there's opportunities to give online. Thank you so much for your generosity in your giving.